Good morning. Let's uh, get started. Since the program uh, is really very packed and I want to then start um, the keynote speaker at, st uh, at um, the same time that we were advertising. So we'll come to CSL Student Conference. Uh, my name is Clara Nashted. I am the director of the Coordinated Science Lab, and it's my privilege and great pleasure to welcome you to the CSL Student Conference. Uh, first, uh, I would like to tell you about a little bit about the CSL, um, and uh, since we have actually tremendous amount of registration uh, and um, number of students that are outside of CSL. So CSL, as you know, is a uh, interdisciplinary research unit that um, has uh, major uh, c confusion, uh, basically coming together uh, of uh, computing, communication, and control, and uh, many, many different areas uh, from uh, electrical engineering, computer science, aero engineering, mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, uh, and so on, are coming together uh, to solve some very important societal problems. And you will actually hear during this particular conference on some of the very interesting problems that are going on in uh, this particular unit and uh, outside of this unit um, that are very relevant to CSL. Uh, other important aspects that um, we are currently engaged in is uh, to create a new intelligent robotics lab as robotics uh, initiatives are being um, very much uh, uh, furthered in particular departments. And this is actually, again, a very interdisciplinary area. Uh, furthermore, we are seeing actually a lot of uh, um, activities in health IT and through our healthcare engineering system center. Uh, there, actually, we are seeing a lot of uh, CSL uh, researchers um, participating new robotics, uh, medical robotics uh, initiatives are starting like with the Robo uh, Raven 2. Furthermore, I would like to actually mention that we are um, uh, engaged also in uh, a lot of student activities uh, and um, particularly we are recognizing the uh, very critical role of students that are uh, housed in CSL or uh, students who are um, working with faculty that are associated with coordinated science lab. And so we are having, besides the CSL uh, student conference, very much uh, um, other activities. Uh, some of you are regular attendees of the social hour, but uh, please come to the social hour that is happening every Friday at uh, 3 p.m. in the third floor. Uh, there actually students come together. Students are advertising some of their research. Um, and also we have uh, competitions like video of the months where students actually can submit uh, various uh, results uh, in a visual form. Uh, and then we are actually picking uh, winners and advertising them on our social networks or on our plasma uh, display. So we are very much interested in uh, um, pushing the particular presence of students. And as I mentioned, through the CSL student conference, uh, uh, I feel the students are truly playing critical role. So today, we are starting actually the 11th uh, CSL student conference. Uh, and um, this particular conference is completely free. Uh, it is 100% organized student conference, which is fantastic to see from, from the administration and leadership point of view how the committee of students are really going and uh, bringing speakers, organizing hot topic sessions, and so on. So um, just to give you a little bit of statistics, uh, this year we have a record uh, registrations. Uh, 422 students uh, got uh, registered for this conference, and you will see through the two days and already yesterday uh, at the keynote speaker uh, session, you, you see a lot of students. Also, um, uh, you will see actually a, a lot of sort of new things that are going to happen this particular year, and I will uh, mention them uh, shortly. Uh, one important aspect is for this conference, the goal is for uh, many uh, graduate students uh, to show their research, and so CSL uh, student conference is the showcase uh, of interesting research. 
uh, we are, we have started actually uh, since last year, I think, uh, to invite actually uh, students from other institutions. It's a very competitive selection. And this year, actually, we are happy to welcome uh, four students from CMU, Stanford, Berkeley, and MIT. This conference truly has been growing every year. Last year, as I mentioned, the non-UIUC students have been introduced. But you will also see not only students from CSL and maybe some of the major departments like uh, ECE and CS and uh, mechanical and iron engineering, but also other uh, sort of students that are outside of um, uh, the CSL departments and also from, for example, students who are associated with IEEE Control System Society. So all of the students that um, uh, are here, please think about next year. There, are, uh, there is a call for organizing committee. Please uh, come and join the organizing committee in the future. I think it's a fantastic way to get um, exposed to coordination, organizational skills uh, that you will need in your future professional life. So I mentioned that there are several new items uh, in this year uh, conference, which uh, I, uh, as a director, have been, have been very excited. Um, first of all, this year, for the first time, we have a graduate student job fair. And um, we are going to see 15 companies that are um, actually participating. You will uh, talk to them as during the job fair. And for this job fair, actually, uh, the organizing committee of the conference was collecting resumes, and the organizing committee got 170 resumes. So this is actually fantastic, and really congratulations to the coordinating committee organizing this uh, graduate student job fair. Actually, I met yesterday a, um, a representative from Intel who is coming to this job fair, and um, uh, he was very excited that this is really for graduate students uh, to uh, get exposed to the companies and talk to them about possible jobs. So. Um, we also, particularly because of the companies coming here, uh, the coordinating uh, and organizing committee uh, secured corporate sponsors like IBM Research and Caterpillar. But um, the job fair will very much uh, uh, concentrate on CSL-related areas, as I mentioned, computing, communication, and control. There are going to be given awards, and this is, again, new thing that uh, we want to reward the performance of the students that are going to be presenting, uh, that are going to be giving very interesting talks or posters, and so we are going to give two best talk and two best poster awards. And again, I find that very, very motivating. Uh, students put a lot of effort into preparing and presenting their ideas. Also, CSL Student Conference has now a new logo, and uh, that actually should be very nice uh, um, sort of propagated uh, uh, tradition for the future uh, conferences. And um, also, uh, we are going to see much, much bigger poster sessions. We are actually doubling the number. As you see, we have 422 registrants, and so there was a lot of submissions, much, much larger submission uh, number that we have ever expected, actually, as the student, the organizing committee informed me. So um, uh, truly, it's a... Uh, great success, uh, and I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for this year, commit, uh, this year conference, and uh, uh, I think it's a fantastic program. So um, I wish you great uh, success uh, during the next two days. Enjoy yourself. And um, at this point, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Sara uh, Bahramian who is the general chair of the CSL Student Conference, and she will actually talk about the days uh, that you will see the program today and tomorrow, as well as introduce our first keynote speaker today. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Nashtad, uh, for this this working? Okay, for this great introduction and welcome notes. And thank you all for coming here today. Uh, I would like to like uh, use this opportunity here to thank Professor Narstedt because she's uh, actually the greatest supporter 
of the CSL Student Conference, and um, we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to do this without her help. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Okay, welcome to the first full day of the CSL Student Conference. Uh, we had the opening plenary talk by Dr. Andrew Fang from Yahoo yesterday, which uh, for those of you who weren't here, it was a great success and a great event. Today we are, um, we are having a lot of more like, interesting events, uh, which include two keynote sessions by um, two invited, invited keynote speakers, Professor Adam Weirman from Caltech and Professor Jesse Grizol from U University of Michigan. And we have two invited student talks from Berkeley and MIT. And we have some talks by, some, by exceptional UIUC students uh, in the morning and afternoon. During the lunch, we're going to have the poster session. As uh, Professor Nasha mentioned, it's going to be a big um, session. And uh, we have a lot of great posters there. So I encourage all of you to attend the session. And at the end of the day, we're going to have the graduate student job fair. Uh, we are all excited about the events here today, and we hope you are too. So looking forward to seeing you at all of the talks and sessions today and tomorrow. Uh, let's start the day by the first keynote speaker of the conference, Professor Adam Weirman. I'll just read a short bio of Professor Weirman, and then we can start. Uh, professor Adam Weirman is a professor in the Department of Computing and Mathematical Sciences at the California Institute of Technology, where he is a founding member of the Rigorous System Research Group, RSRG, and mm, maintains a popular blog called Rigor Plus Relevance. His research interests center around resource allocation and scheduling decisions in computer systems and services. He received the 2011 ACM Sigmetrics Rising Star Award, the 2014 IEEE Communications Society William R. Bennett Prize, and has been co-author of uh, on papers that received the best paper awards at ACM Sigmetrics, IEEE Infocom, IFIP Performance twice, IEEE Green Computing Conference, IEEE Power and Energy Society, general meeting and ACM green metrics. Please help me welcome Professor Adam Weirman for the first keynote uh, session of the day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I guess I should use this for the recording, is that right? Uh, That's uh, reasonable volume and everything. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back uh, to UIC, even if it's cold. Uh, I think <laughs> so. In LA, it was 85 degrees yesterday, so it's nice to experience one day of winter here. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm talking about today is data centers and energy, and this is a space that I've worked uh, for a while now, and uh, basically we did a lot of work on one story, which is the common story, that uh, data centers are energy hogs. And I'm going to kind of uh, give you a little bit of survey around that story first, and then I'll move to what I think is actually the, a more interesting story, uh, which is what we've been working on in the last few years, where not just to view them as hogs, but to view them as resources for the grid. But I think the story that we've all heard is the one that we should start with, which is uh, data centers are energy hogs. And if, if we think about that, uh, you know, the number that you've probably heard is the uh, electricity usage of data centers are 2 to 3 percent of the U.S. total. Uh, now, that's not a very impressive number, actually. It's a small number. Uh, I mean, it's significant, but the, the more impressive part of this, and this is the part that usually gets buried when people give that stat, is that it's growing at about 12 percent a year, whereas the electricity usage of the U.S. is growing at about 1 percent a year. Uh, and so they're significant now, and they're going to be more and more significant as we move forward, is, is the story. And to make that kind of tangible, these are uh, the numbers that, uh, you know, the sort of physical uh, representation of the energy that you can think of, and the emissions in particular. 
So this is a number that, I guess, when it first came out, Google fought for a while because the first number that a research group put out was over 100, and Google argued that it should have lower. They banded about, this is, I think, the fair number. About 60 letters typed into Google uh, is about the same emissions as boiling a kettle of tea. Uh, and if you think of a server idling on a rack, uh, that's about like a car idling at the curb. Uh, and so you can think of this whenever you, you know, are interacting with a cloud computing system. Or something, right? There's a lot of emissions that are at the back end supporting this. Uh, these are not environmentally free operations. Uh, and once you start to realize that, you start to be motivated to think a lot about what we can do to improve uh, our environmental footprint of the computing that we use and the computing that's becoming so central to our lives. And so there's been a lot of focus on that, things like, you know, there was a 10-part series at NPR, a five-part series in New York Times, and, and I think the nice entry point, if you uh, uh, are curious about some of the numbers behind this, I'm not going to go too deep into them, is Greenpeace. They put a, a yearly report out each year in the spring for the last four years now. Uh, basically detailing, in some sense, it's like the slap on the wrist for tech companies. Uh, that's the model that, you know, they're the, they're the annoyed parents uh, in the room, and they're going around and they're measuring and looking at each of the major companies and saying, this is how you're doing for energy, and giving a report card. Uh, and it's had an impact, actually, in terms of uh, the companies responding to it. Uh, Apple is a good example where in the first few report cards, they were really doing terrible, and they've made big pushes, and now they're kind of leading the pack in terms of the environmental issues surrounding the cloud. Um, so if you're curious about the, you know, how individual companies are doing, take a look at those reports. Uh, but I think for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to gloss over that and just, you know, assume that you kind of understand that data centers are a big deal in terms of electricity. And as a result, over the last decade, there's been a ton of research on making them more energy efficient. Uh, and that was kind of the initial uh, goal. Uh, but then I think once you think about it, it's not enough to make them more energy efficient. If, you, if you've heard of Jevons' paradox, it's the idea that the more efficient a resource gets, it doesn't mean that you use less of it. It means that you actually use more of it because, well, you can use it more efficiently, and so you go after more. And that's exactly what's going to happen with cloud computing, right? The more energy efficient we make it, the more computing you can pack into these buildings, right? So you're just going to use more of it. And so it's, it's important to not just target energy efficiency. It's energy efficiency is clearly valuable, but you have to target sustainability, too. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways you can go about that. Uh, and that's basically been, I think, the last five years of the field is thinking about ways that we can improve sustainability of, of data centers in this space. And so uh, I'd say, you know, to give you the 10,000-foot overview of the field, there's two canonical problems at this point uh, in that kind of everybody has written at least one paper on in the field. Uh, and the first one is uh, dynamic resizing. Uh, and this has been around for about 15 years at this point, sort of the, the initial systems work back at, the, you know, in 01. Uh, which even predates uh, most of my work, you know, most of, most of my uh, research career, is was about making it possible. So this was the sort of systems level, can we get virtual machines, can we move them around, can we dynamically, uh, you know, maintain the capacity. Around uh, this period in the 05 to 010 region, you started to get more sophisticated algorithms for, we know this is possible, how can we do this in a smart way? to minimize resource usage or start to be aware of energy efficiency. And then here, you know, and that's kind of the transition point, and that's where, where a lot of our work started to fit in, because I tend to work more on the algorithmic side. Uh, but the story here is basically, uh, I'll, I'll give it to you in a second, the story here is basically the brain-dead simple one of, we know workloads in data centers are highly non-stationary and diurnal. Uh, so this is a workload from an HP data center. You can see kind of a peak during the day, another little mini peak at night when they do their backup background stuff. Uh, and you, you see this very predictable diagonal pattern. It's very dynamic. Well, if we know the workloads do this, well, we should do dynamic resizing. We should, if we don't think very much, uh, note the fact that servers use about 30 to 50 percent of their peak power just from being on, even if they're not doing something. And so we should be shifting these servers, if we're not using them, into some sort of deep low power state, deep sleep state, low power state, or, or off uh, if possible. Uh, and so we should have an active service uh, pool that mimics our workload, right? This is the, this is the simplistic idea behind dynamic resizing. Uh, and it's, while this seems obvious, uh, it's actually quite controversial, uh, or it was for a long time, uh, quite controversial. And the reason is that while it seems simple to adapt provisioning to minimum cost, the, the downside is switching isn't free. So there's, you know, the latency aspects of it and the systems aspects, system complexity aspects of it. But even more than that, there's the wear and tear aspects of it. So flipping a server off and back on has a wear and tear cost that's about the same as the energy cost of running it for half an hour to an hour, depending on the, the hardware that you're using and how you do it. Uh, and so 
that means that if you think about doing this kind of provisioning, you have to kind of be able to predict the future. You have to know something about the fact that you're going to be willing and able to leave this server off for an hour if I'm going to turn it off now. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be worth it in the long run in terms of cost, and it's going to be damaging. And so, so you've got to pay attention to that. And that makes this quite controversial, because now uh, if we're going to do this resizing, we need to be able to predict. Workloads aren't that predictable, at the, especially at the fine-grained time scale. And more so than that, it's not just these interactive workloads that you have in a data center. You also tend to have uh, batch, large, delay tolerant things. So think about these as the, ba the archival tasks in Gmail or rendering a big Pixar video, which HP does all the time, things like this. Uh, and these have the benefit of deadlines that have some flexibility. And so you can schedule them. You can do valley filling or load shifting. Uh, and now all of a sudden your workload doesn't really look as spiky as this. It's much smoother. And if your workload is much smoother, then do we really need to turn things off to smooth it? Uh, and is it really going to be valuable? And so the fact that you can do this makes it maybe not as obvious that you want to do this, especially given the wear and tear costs and the risk involved of maybe things won't turn on if you turn them off, uh, these sorts of things. And so it actually, you know, there, there was a large controversy about when to do each of these and how to balance these techniques. Um, and it becomes even more complicated when you start to bring in other features. So electricity prices are not static. They can be time varying. Uh, if you're trying to make this so renewable, then maybe you have solar availability or wind availability on site that you want to try to make use of. And maybe the biggest one is really, if you're thinking about sustainability and energy efficiency, cooling matters a lot. And temperature and humidity impact the efficiency of your data center. And that's typically measured by the power usage effectiveness which is the ratio of the energy coming into the data center over the energy being that's actually going to the servers. And that's going to be time varying as a result of these environmental factors. Oops. Uh, and so if that's time varying and all of these other things are time varying, and then they all go into the relative value of these sorts of techniques, then you have a very complicated algorithmic problem subject to these, you know, knowing something about the future and predictions and switching costs and all this. It becomes a very challenging problem to make it, you know, and you have to be able to solve that problem very well, very, you know, near optimally, if it's going to be worthwhile to switch. And so this is kind of where the, the research field went. And we worked on this for a long time on the algorithmic side uh, and uh, came up with some things which I'll tell you about at the, at the second part of this talk. And I think at this point it's a fairly well-established thing. Most companies do a combination of this, have a system that, that does something like this in their data centers. And, and we were you know, one of the first ones, I guess, to release uh, with the goal of not just making it sustainable, but making it nearly net zero. And this was joint work with uh, HP a little while back. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it while I play this demo. I, I always show this because this, is the, this was the real dashboard that HP had. It, it's hideous and it's complicated. I apologize. But it's the real one, so uh, I didn't get to design it. <laughs> um, but, but if you pay attention to the top part here, this is our net zero data center architecture running on a Palo Alto data center. And so the data center had PV on top uh, attached to the grid. And so this picture will tell you where it's getting energy from. And there's just three of the servers highlighted, so you can see the workload. Uh, and then it had two sources for cooling. This is where the PUE being time varying matters. So it had outside cooling that it could use uh, and chiller, uh, chiller cooling. Uh, and then the only thing to pay attention to down here, this is kind of the plan that actually happens. But it's done online. And you, you're using predictions about the workload. So this is, this is real. Uh, and then maybe the nice number is here. So you get about 80% emission savings. But you know it's really getting fairly close to net zero. So this is over a week trace. Uh, it's about 78% cut in the energy from the grid that's being used. Uh, and this is just from rooftop PV, so it's not a massive PV array by any means. Um, so I can you know, tell you this, uh, you know, and you can see, and it, it sort of, it does the obvious things, right? So it starts off at night, uh, and so there's a lot of outside air. The outside air is cool. You can use that for chilling, but you need to use the grid because you don't have PV. And then as the sun starts to come up, you start to get some energy from the PV, but you start to be able to not make use of the outside air as much and have to use your chiller. And so the trends are kind of clear, but how you balance these with predictions of workloads uh, is actually a, a very challenging algorithmic issue. And so that's what's, what's running underneath. And there's a lot that went into this beyond the algorithms that I'll tell you about, of course, in the system design. And, and these are the people at HP that helped us uh, with all that. Um, OK, so that's a really brief overview of this kind of typical canonical story of doing dynamic resizing and load shifting uh, to manage and, and make data centers more, more sustainable. 
Uh, from there, you know, the, the next level up is to make this more heterogeneous, heterogeneous and to look at not just one data center, but here in this picture, each of these green boxes is a data center at a location where Google has one in the US. And so you can think of doing the exact same problem, but now doing it in a high dimensional space where you're not just optimizing one data center, you're optimizing a pool of data centers. Uh, and so now you have a choice in addition to everything that's internal to one, you have a choice of where to, re where to route a request. So if you get a request from UIC and it comes to this proxy, you have lots of options for, for where to send it. Uh, and so you can optimize that again based on where there's sun for your renewables, where the temperature is right to be able to use outside air cooling. Uh, but of course now you have the extra constraint of data availability and data mobi mobility to make sure that you cache things appropriate to make all that possible. And so that's where you know another of the canonical problems is. So this kind of was the initial canonical problem and now, now this is maybe the next canonical problem, the more complicated version of that. And there's lots of other things as well, but this, this gives you a taste of, of that kind of story. So if you think of data centers as energy hogs, there's a lot of algorithmic issues that you can do to try to minimize that impact. Uh, but I guess what I want to focus on more is just revisiting that statement. Data centers are energy hogs. Yes, they use a lot of energy, but actually they, they use it pretty well. Uh, I mean, at this point, data centers, in terms of their PUEs, are you know, under 1.1, which means really most of the energy coming into a data center goes to the computing. Yeah, we can still use the data center, you know, use the energy within the computing a lot more effectively, I think. So there's a lot of improvements to be made. But, you know, they're pretty effective. Uh, and we get a lot of value from the energy that goes into a data center. Uh, but actually, the other thing that's really nice about them is they're highly instrumented and they're highly flexible. So all of that work that went into sustainable, sustainable data center design that I just gave you the peek at means that we can do a lot of things to manage data centers in a dynamic way. And because they're large energy users, maybe we can actually make use of them in a similar way we make use to large scale storage on the grid. And so this is, the, this is what we've been working on the last year or two, uh, is the pitch that actually data centers, you know, they're hogs, yes, they use a lot, but actually because they use a lot, they're really valuable since they're flexible. If we can find a way to exploit the flexibility of data centers, then they can provide something that we're sorely lacking in the grid today, which is large scale storage. Uh, so to make that a little bit more tangible, uh, I mean, at this point, renewable energy isn't just coming, it's here. Uh, I mean, there, there's, there's large uh, penetration of renewables around the US, uh, especially in California, where, where I'm from. Uh, but the challenge with it is it's not enough to install it. You have to be able to use it. And uh, it's uncontrollable, intermittent, and uncertain. So you can't have it on demand. You can't have it when you want it. Uh, there are large fluctuations which are difficult to predict. And uh, this means that you really have, you know, it causes a, a huge system problem to integrate it. And so this is, a tip. if you're in the sort of smart grid area, you've seen this figure before. This is a, a bunch of, each line is a different day. So this is 24 hours. This is days at the same location within a month. Uh, and so this is the hours of the day. This is the average. The average is nice and smooth, but any given day, the trajectory is wild and intermittent and fluctuating, and it's hard to know what to do with it, right? Uh, and so why does this cause a problem? It causes a problem because if you take a cartoon view of the smart grid, basically, you have to make sure that at all given points, generation matches load. So you, the amount of generation coming in matches the demand for it. Uh, so this is supply equals demand. And in the old days where you didn't have solar and PV, this was easy. Well, not easy, but you could do this in a straightforward way. You could do it by predicting the load, predicting the demand. And this is the actual predictions in California. The purple is the day ahead. The dark, this second dotted one is four hour ahead, I believe. And then this is the real time realization. And so you can see that this is just a very small deviation that you can just correct around. Uh, and then since you can control generation and turn it on once you want, whenever you want, once you, have low, once you have the prediction here, you just turn it on. And you can even give yourself some flexibility. You can control it via markets uh, up, until the, up until the very real time time scales and still get away with it. So in some sense, that's the, the status quo. Generation follows demand. Predict demand and turn on generation to follow it. But now with wind and PV coming in, generation is much less controllable, high uncertainty. You can't do that anymore. Uh, and if you try, basically what happens is it pushes price volatility in the market because unpredictability in the wind is going to lead to price spikes. And the interesting thing here is it's not just price spikes up, it's price spikes down. You can be in a situation where you pay people 200 bucks a kilowatt hour to get, take their, you know, to, to run and be connected to the grid. Uh, and these are real things that happen every day in Texas and Germany and, and uh, you know, lots of these places. 
And because of the volatility and the lack of predictability, you actually need to have this controllable load on just in case you need it. So if the wind doesn't blow or if a cloud goes over the sun. And these are called reserves. And so you need to have way more reserves than if you didn't have PV. And these reserves then are, all, you know, are countering the whole point. They're countering the sustainability gains that you get from the renewables. And uh, so I like, th there's a lot more going on in this example than just that, but I like the example of Germany here because you saw all of these things come to a head. So they have a huge uh, investment in renewable energy uh, over you know, multiple years. And last year, basically the effect of the, this huge investment, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it, I always get it wrong, uh, is that they actually increased emissions. So this was, you know, five years of heavy billion dollar investment in renewables led to not decreased emissions, but increased emissions. And, you know, there were a lot of things, like I said, that went in, into it, but in some sense, it was a market failure. It was an example where they didn't change and redesign the market rules. And so they ended up with these sorts of issues, uh, squeezing out the clean conventional generation. Um, so squeezing out nuclear and, and other sorts of things. Um, yeah, so we need to be careful, and so we need to really re think about redesigning these markets and finding alternatives. And the key, I, th I think, is really down here. So you have to move to a regime where at least a little bit demand is following generation. And if you can't get enough demand, uh, demand response, demand that follows generation, then you're in trouble. Uh, and so you need demand response or storage somehow to help manage this intermittency. And there's a lot of research in the smart grid world about how to get this. We're gonna hear some talks today about demand response issues, I think. Uh, and you know, there's lots of sources you can imagine. So the, the things that are on the top of people's head here are you know, EVs. You know, we have these large batteries that people hopefully will be plugging into their garage. We can sort of draw from them and use that to counter availability. People's air conditioning systems. Pool pumps is a nice easy one in California and Florida. Uh, and you know, home storage possibly that comes. This is the Tesla uh, wall battery. Uh, but the, the perspective that I think, you know, I want to make here is actually we have a way easier option uh, on the table. The low-hanging fruit isn't these. The low-hanging fruit is data centers. Uh, and the reason is up here, what do you have to do to get any significant storage? You have to control hundreds of thousands of these loads, each of which has a residential consumer with who knows what as their utility function interacting with these markets, right? This is an extremely difficult engineering task and sociological task. Here, the same sort of capacity can be extracted from one data center. Uh, and so we, data centers are huge. So think, you know, there's a wide range, but think of these as like 20 to 40 megawatts per in one building. So that's an enormous load. That's hundreds of thousands of households worth of load in one building. Usage is growing at about the same rate that PV installations are growing in most of the country. Uh, they're highly automated already because of all this work that we've already been doing to incorporate flexibility. Uh, and you know, if we, if we think of that, the flexibility that we already have gives us a really nice supply curve where if you only need a little bit of flexibility, you can you know, plug into cooling and lighting. If you need a little bit more, you can plug into demand shaping a little bit. If you need even more, then they all have backup gener batteries and uh, PV gener or backup batteries and uh, backup generation on site that you can plug into and make use of. And so the, you know, basically every data center has a backup gas or diesel generator on site in addition to a large uh, you know, UPS uh, storage system. Uh, and so they have all this stuff on site. And so for very quick, uh, uh, there's actually a really nice test study that LBNL did where you can you know, in 10 minutes basically get huge percentage of flexibility from these buildings in today's operating settings. So this is not a you know, data center of the future. This is today, it's feasible, it's been tested on the site. Uh, and this is the result of all this work, basically, uh, actually taking sense. And so the combination of that means that you basically have a flexible energy resource plugged in today to the grid that's not being used at all for flexibility. Uh, and so how big a deal is this? Uh, I mean, this is, this is the picture I, I've been trying to give to industry people. It's a little bit simplistic. Really, it's a DR resource, but, uh, but I like you know, this picture of, you know, just think of it like a battery on the grid. So if, if we view it as a battery on the grid, what's the potential? And so here are some real numbers uh, that we put together, or you know, pseudo real. So this is, uh, there's a real data center location on a circuit in Southern California. There's a large scale PV installation going in on that circuit. They're trying to do capacity planning for how much storage they need to install to be able to manage this circuit given the new PV installation. And so they're deciding on locations and these sorts of things. And so the, the study we did was consider optimally placed storage uh, so you're going to invest, you know, $5 million in a new large-scale storage system. You're going to put it in the best possible location. 
how much, what would we need to extract, I guess, how much storage capacity uh, can a data center replace uh, if, you, if you can tap into it with the R markets of some sort? That's the, that's the question. Uh, and so we'd have real traces for all these things, and we compared to optimally traced story. And the idea is, you know, 20 megawatt data center will be a little bit conservative on the flexibility, 20% flexibility. How much storage can it replace? Both in terms of cost of operating the system, emissions of operating the system, voltage violations rate, all of these sorts of things. They all give basically the same answer. And the answer really is kind of two-thirds, um, you know, two-thirds of a, a, a megawatt. So uh, that's about five million. Uh, and if you, you know, if you want a fast-acting storage facility of that site, that's a five million dollar investment being replaced by just creating a market opportunity for the data center. And you know, so if you think, uh, you know, as an economist, this gives you your operating budget for the market that can target one data center. Imagine, you know, of course, there are many other data centers uh, as well in these circuits that you can target. So for each one, you can think of that as the market opportunity. And that's if you don't expect, don't allow, don't imagine them as part of this geographical system. If you imagine them having some geographic flexibility as well, then you get up to one megawatt. You also get up to one megawatt if they each have 25% flexibility instead of 20% flexibility. And so you can really, in my mind, I think of you know one data center as a megawatt uh, storage facility, which is five to ten million dollars, depending on how quickly you want it to respond and how long its lifetime you want it to be. Um, and so that's that's a huge potential, I think, uh, for these sorts of resources. That's just completely untapped right now. And and in some sense, there there's a lot of things holding us back from it. But but if we think about what that is today, maybe the biggest thing is the market opportunities today. And so if we look at what's, ha what's available for a data center today, uh, these are the sorts of programs. And if, you ha if you're not in the space, this won't mean much to you, but I'll explain two of them. So the, 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 the high level point is that data centers hardly participate unless they're forced to in these programs. And so the common case is that they're forced to in coincident pre-pricing, which is not even really much of a demand response program. So coincident pre-pricing is the idea that there's some bad hour in a month for the utility. Uh, which is where their usage, the usage, their aggregate usage is peaking. So they're going to charge anybody who uses electricity during that peak hour a lot of money. And to make sure that you're not completely surprised by this, they're going to give you warnings five or ten times a month saying this might be a coincident peak hour. You might want to cut your electricity usage. And so you, the data center will get some warnings. And you know, the, in data centers, for example, in Colorado, uh, Fort Collins, HP has a data center that's forced to participate in this. About a half of their energy budget their, their monthly bill, which is you know two to four million dollars a month, goes to paying these coincident pike peak penalties basically, uh, and so these are a big deal in terms of their bill, but they're really terrible in terms of they're high risk for the data centers. So no data center would choose to do this, uh, and they don't give much flexibility for the utility because you can only send about five to ten warnings. If you send any more than that, people are going to ignore them because it's they're just going to pay for one hour at the end of the day, right? <laughs> at the end of the month. And so if you send more than five, they're already starting to think, oh, I don't need to respond to this one. I've already responded to the, the previous four. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so you, didn't, you get almost no flexibility on the utility side to counter your load. And on the data center side, it's extremely risky. So this is a lose-lose sort of program. Um, the, the closest to a win-win that exists today is uh, emergency demand response, which is something where the data centers sign up at the beginning of the year and say, OK, I'm willing to provide up to X uh, response uh, once or twice a year when you ask for it. And I'll pay a big penalty if when you ask for it, I can't provide that response. Uh, and so you kind of opt into this in the beginning of the year. You get paid just for being in the program. Most years, you don't get called. If you do get called, you have to do something. Otherwise, there's a huge penalty. And so some data centers can participate in such programs. And the way they participate is they just turn on their backup generator. They say, I can participate up to the capacity of my backup generator. And whenever you give me an emergency signal, I turn on my diesel generator. Uh, <laughs> and so you know, that's what happens. And, and it actually has been good. So this is maybe the biggest example of a failure avoided. So this, there was a potential failure in the Northeast and Canada that was averted because of about 1,000 sites and a couple hundred data centers participating in EDR. And this, you know, the, the after the fact analysis said that this would have taken out power in about 10 states uh, in the Northeast. And it was completely avoided and, and kept minimal because of this EDR program. But the response was all via backup generators in the data centers. And this is a pollution plot showing emissions uh, as a function. And th this is simulated, so this isn't real data. But uh, basically, if 50% of that was coming from uh, behind the meter generation from diesel, then you see this spike, which is about 
50% increase in uh, emissions as a result of this, which is, again, completely counter to the idea of we're using renewables to counter emissions, yet because of renewables, we use these backup generators, which are nasty on emissions. It's, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, really anticlimactic if this is the way that you have to uh, manage the system to impact renewables. Yeah. So this, this was done by the EPA as, uh, so it was really a very detailed modeling of how they thought the backup generation for this event was calculated. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this was not our work. This was an EPA after the fact study on the value of these sorts of programs. Yeah, so, so I think basically, you know, all of this was to highlight big potential. Today it's not working. Uh, and I think, you know, in some sense, what we need is both new algorithms in terms of managing participation. So how, if you're a data center, do you manage your flexibility to participate in demand response programs? This is very different than managing your workloads to match, you know, the internal system efficiency. So how can you balance the efficiency with these sorts of things? And on the market design part, we just, we need DR markets that are appropriate for the risk tolerance and, and capabilities of data centers. And so over the last two years or so, uh, there's been a lot of work, and, and I should have big dot, dot, dots at the end of both these lists, because there's a lot uh, of current work even going on today in these areas, both around market designs. And here, the market designs, some target just data centers, but often these are uh, targeting, targeting also commercial buildings. So in some sense, the idea is these, these distributed, large commercial resources, how do you extract flexibility from them? And I think the perspective is, I think, that data centers are the low-hanging fruit, but if you design a program that's good for data centers, it should also work for many other uh, residential and commercial buildings as well. Uh, and then on the algorithmic side, there's a lot to do there. So what I figured was I'd talk about the algorithms rather than the markets, because I think that probably uh, gets a little bit more interesting to people here. Uh, although this is what we've been working on more today, there, although we have a few new things here. Uh, and this, I think, is nice because it ties to machine learning, actually. The, the, and it's also just some nice theory that I like to talk about. So, so I'm going to dig into that now. And uh, hopefully I've convinced you that it's relevant. And now I'm going to dig into the theory side of, of what I do in terms of algorithms. And I think you know, the nugget here is that all of the algorithms that we've implemented here, and these are algorithms that now have gone from Ethereum to uh, simulation to large-scale deployment, are based on OCO, online convex optimization, which is you know, one of the classic online learning uh, problems that hopefully you've all seen or at least heard of at some point in your, in your careers. And if not, it's long past time, so here, consider this your introduction. So, so how do we make the mapping? Uh, this is the cartoon you should think in your head. So you have some workload coming in, uh, and think of this as a combination of, you know, I could make this very complicated. This could be a vector in terms of electricity prices and, you know, cooling capability and all these, and the load back up and blah, blah, blah. But just think of this as, you know, to simple, the workload coming in, number of active servers that you're controlling to match it. Think of everything as discretized so that you're, because you're not going to change your number of active servers every second. You're going to change it on a slower time scale. So think of this as that slower time scale uh, problem. And you know, in the simple case of a homogeneous, very you know, uniform data center, this could be one dimensional, but really this is a high dimensional problem. So this is a problem where workloads, there's lots of different components, lots of different dimensions of which you can characterize the workload, uh, and lots of different types of servers. So both the number of servers and, the, and these things are high dimension and, and over different spaces. Uh, and so geographical load balancing would be an example of a high dimensional version of the problem. And so then, what do you frame the data center as doing? You frame the data center as solving a cost minimization problem where uh, it has operating constraints. You know, it has some number of servers. We'll, we won't worry about integer number of servers. We'll just round at the end of the day because uh, we're talking about very big numbers here. Uh, but there's you know, some max capacity. And usually, you can represent the service level constraints in terms of some box constraint here. So basically, you keep enough servers on to maintain whatever service level constraint you need for your uh, application. Uh, and you know, so there's some convex constraint that represents that. And so you have just some stability operating constraint that is some convex set there. And then you have a, a convex cost function uh, and a norm that is your switching cost. So this is, think of this as your operating cost. So as a very simplistic example, you can think of this as being a function of the workload where you have a load balancing internal optimization where you're deciding how much workload to send to each of the servers that's on. And then each server that's on has some cost function, which is a function of the delay that it's providing and the energy or whatever else. And so this is the very simpling, simplistic one. Uh, the real model is very complicated. You know, uh, it took a student and me about 
nine months to agree on a model with HP uh, before we went uh, and deployed something there. Uh, it, and it ended up being kind of a five nested optimizations of the different internal systems. Uh, and, you know, but at the end of the day, it wasn't so much an engineering modeling task as a business modeling task. Where do you want to focus uh, optimizations? What are you willing to trade for what in terms of long-term uh, operating constraints? So that's that. And then the, the switching costs are kind of easy to think. Just, you know, the simplest one would be like an L1 where you just pay some amount to turn a server on or off. And, you know, that amount is beta. Um, but you can think of this as more complicated and more complicated norms capturing other factors that might play in. Uh, and so the general problem, right, in terms of the math is just this. So we have an online problem where we are choosing a number of active servers, then we, our uh, cost function is revealed to us based on the workload that arrives. Uh, we pay the switching cost uh, to change our actions, uh, and then we choose another set, and so on. And so, you know, I'll add predictions soon, but right now think of this as purely online. I choose a configuration of my servers, a workload arrives, I choose a workload arrives, yeah. No. So, yeah, think of that as asymmetric, but that's fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's that. And then our goal is to come up with an online algorithm. Right? Uh, so that's, that's the goal. And if we think about what we want from this online out, oh, sorry, before I say what we want. Uh, so we're using this in data centers. There's lots of other places this applies, of course. Uh, um, at video streaming, there's some people here that actually have applied these algorithms to that. Uh, electricity generation planning, if you're in smart grid, we're doing some work applying it there. And then all the classic learning and uh, OR type places that these things apply. Um, so in terms of what we want to optimize, this now this is a caricature, but uh, in some sense there are two communities uh, in this space because there are two measures that people tend to focus on. Uh, one being regret and one being the competitive ratio. So uh, broadly speaking, regret is at the core of the learning approach to OCO, and uh, competitive ratio is the, at the core of the, of the algorithm's approach to OCO. And if you haven't seen those measures before, they're very simple and natural. So regret is basically saying, you're do what's the, how am I doing compared to the best static choice that you could have made in retrospect? So uh, you know, this is learning a static concept. If there's, if there's some static concept out there, some best provisioning that you're trying to learn, uh, you don't know it a priori, you're doing it in this online environment. You want, after the fact, your, your algorithm to be doing uh, you know, nearly as well as the best thing that you could have chosen uh, as a static control. Uh, and competitive ratio is uh, comparing to the actual offline optimal. So the dynamic choices that were, would have been the offline optimal if you had known everything a priori. So comparing to that offline optimal. And uh, in our world, we care really about both of them. So, so when we go to HP, uh, you know, first of all, they're doing something static now. They're, you know, leaving all their servers on, but they're buying what they, you know, but they're having what they think is the optimal number of servers there, right? And so if you're saying that you're doing better than what they're doing, you're saying that you're doing well for regret. Uh, and if you're going to convince them to add a bunch of complexity to go to a dynamic control policy, uh, they don't want to do this multiple times. They want to do it once and be near optimal, right? And so they want to be good for this and good for this. Uh, and this is a different perspective than, than most of the time, because in learning, in some sense, this is the natural measure, because you're learning some concept. So if you're learning a static concept, this is right. And in algorithms are controlled, this is sort of the more natural concept. And so really, they tend to be looked at in different communities. But I think, at least in this application, it really does make sense to look at them together and say that we want an algorithm that simultaneously has low regret and small competitive ratio. And in terms of what you're aiming for, you know, in this community, you tend to add, aim for sublinear regret, which means that if you look at the per, per state regret, it goes away, it goes to zero, and so you're doing great. And here, you know, it's a little bit harder problem, and so the best you look for is a constant competitive ratio. And I just want to emphasize that the important thing about the difference here is not ratio versus uh, difference. It's this bar comparing to the static optimal versus the offline optimal. Uh, the ratio versus difference doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I could look at, I could have made both of them a ratio or both of them a difference, and it wouldn't have changed anything. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's the goal. And, you know, like I said, our, our sort of new goal compared to what communities have looked at before is we want to do well for both. Uh, um, and really, I guess before our stuff, there was only kind of one paper that, uh, that looked at both measures, uh, which I felt very strange. So if, if anybody knows of other papers in other domains, maybe, where people were looking at both regret and credit ratio, I'd be very interested. It's, it seems like such a natural thing to want to do both, to me at least. 
but that's the control background. But even in learning, so if you think of learning, you know, this is saying, you know, it seems natural to want an algorithm that can learn a static concept and a dynamic concept and doesn't have to be told ahead of time whether it's in the static world or a dynamic world. Uh, and if you have an algorithm that can do that, then it should be able to do well for both of these. Uh, uh, okay, so now this is the like two minute version of you know two decades worth of work. Uh, but in some sense, <laughs> uh, the, if we go through these two, uh, the first one, it's kind of easy to do, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say easy, but in retrospect, it seems easy uh, to do sublinear regret. Uh, and what I say easy, it's, what I mean is really, there are simple algorithms that can do very well. Uh, and so in particular, if all, if all you do is gradient descent in an online way, you already get root t regret, where t is the time horizon you're looking over. Uh, and this is the best possible up to constants that you can get with any online algorithm in this context. And so. Very simple algorithms do very well. If you do you know, a little bit better and do an online Newtons, you can improve constants, you can do better in slightly general settings, blah, blah, blah. But you know, already very simple algorithms do very well for regret, and there's lots of algorithms that can achieve that guarantee. So that's kind of the message that I have there. Competitive ratio, much harder. Uh, so here, there are uh, impossibility results in general that you can't be better than sort of square roots t uh, competitive ratio, so you can't have constant competitive ratio in general. In the scalar case, and now actually there was just a new paper by some uh, people that will appear in stock this year uh, that says in the two-dimensional case as well, uh, you can get constant competitive ratios. Uh, but beyond the two-dimensional case, there's no known algorithm that can get a constant competitive ratio. Uh, and this one I highlight because it's ours. Uh, this was the first one that could get a constant competitive ratio in that space. Uh, but then you, know, you think, okay, I can do well here. I can do well here, at least in limited settings. Maybe I should be able to do well for both. I should be able to combine them. The answer is no. So, the, and I think this is a bit surprising. There's really, it's impossible to do well for both regret and competitive ratio. There's something impossible about simultaneously learning dynamic and static concepts. Uh, and so, this is the the formal statement. Basically, if you, uh, uh, and it, and I guess I put it up here mainly to emphasize that it's impossible even in the simple cases. So, linear cost functions, one dimensional, two different cost functions that you switch between. Uh, and so the form is saying, in some sense, for any arbitrary large constant uh, and every algorithm, you can have the competitive ratio plus the normalized regret being bigger than that constant. So one of them has to be uh, larger than you want. Um, yeah, so to give you some intuition for why this is true, uh, basically the way you can go about showing this is with this example. So you have two linear cost functions, opposite gradients on a, on a simple one-dimensional space. And if you think about what algorithms do, what is an online gradient descent going to do here? Well, an adversary is going to force you to play on this upper envelope. And so you're going to kind of step down towards this middle point. But as soon as you cross over, the adversary can make you go up and pay the price of the higher one again. Uh, and so you're kind of stepping down, and you learn this point. You learn this static crossover point, and that's a good static optimal that the adversary, right? This is, this is the static optimal given an adversarial workload. Um, and so that's great. But then the dynamic optimal would have, or the offline optimal would have been at those points and just been switching back and forth between those points. Uh, and so if you set this up so that the slopes are, st slopes are steep, et cetera, this gap is really big. And so you're good for this, but you're bad for that. Uh, on the other hand, I, I haven't told you what this one does, lazy capacity provisioning, but basically what it does is it lazily sticks at this endpoint until it incurs, en incurs enough cost that it's worth moving. And so it goes there, it you know, gets a very good point for a little while, but then the adversary switches and forces it to pay this large point. It sticks there for a little bit, but then after the experience is too much cost because of its laziness, it switches, but it doesn't switch, it doesn't take a small step, it takes a big step all the way to the other side, and it does the same thing. It sort of gets a good point for a little while, but then lazily sticks there until it incurs a little cost. And basically by defining the laziness rule, you can make sure that you never incur more than a constant factor difference uh, at each of the endpoints, and so you're constant competitive. But that constant factor difference can be very large compared to the difference between here to here if these slopes are, are fairly flat. Uh, and so, again, you know, that sort of algorithm can't do well for regret, because right, for regret you need to be really close to this. Uh, and so if there's a, you know, a long gap there, then you're, you're dead for regret if you're constantly lazily, switch, lazily switching. And so the, what we can prove basically is that every algorithm that does well for competitive ratio has to have this kind of lazy form, 
And every algorithm that does well for regret has to have this kind of gradient form. Uh, and so there's no way that you can do both. Uh, and so now coming back, I, I said I'd get to predictions. Because I think predictions you know, for our application are the crucial thing. We do have available predictions. They're not perfect, but they're useful. And if, we, if I think of doing something in a data center, I'm certainly not going to do it in this adversarial model where I pretend I don't know anything about the future. I'm going to use the information that I have about the future. And I'm going to, even though it's noisy, it's going to help me a lot. And so the question would be, can predictions help us get around this? Is that the thing that's the, you know, is this is sort of lack of information about the future, the right, the, the stumbling block? And then you get into the question of, well, how do we talk about predictions in online algorithms? And this is, tends to get a little messy. Uh, so the way we view it here is we tend to look at a parameterized cost function. And the predictions are of the parameter. And so the y of t is the parameter. And so as an example, you, think, you can think of this as like an online lasso. So, so an online tracking problem where you're trying to track the y of t, and so you're choosing your x of t, and you've got your kind of control matrix there. And so you're trying to track this, and, you, and the, predict, the thing you have a prediction of is the, that, you know, in the data center world, maybe y of t is your optimal system configuration. You don't know it. You have a prediction of what it's going to be for the next time step. So how well can you do in tracking that? Right? Uh, and so this would be a simple, nice thing. And this is actually useful also in terms of big data type problems if you think of single pass algorithms. A single pass lasso is an online lasso that you'd have some information about the correlation structure. That would give you your predictions. Um, and so how would an online algorithms person go about this problem? Uh, I'm going to tell you why this is bad in just a second. But how would an online algorithm person go about it? Well, the typical way you deal with predictions there are you assume that they're exact within your prediction window, or at least maybe within epsilon error within your prediction window, some bounded error there, and then adversarial outside of your prediction window. Right? This, it seems natural on the face of it to say, oh, I'm a theoretician. This is something like what predictions will do. Let's just do this. It should be easy to analyze. And it, it is easy to analyze, so, but it is, gives us the wrong answer in the sense that, so in that model, what we can prove is that you need unbounded predictions, so uh, predictions that grow unboundedly with the horizon length to be able to do well for both competitive ratio and regret. So I view this as another impossibility result. So you can't do well for, for regret and competitive ratio unless you have, with, with a constant prediction window uh, in this model. But I, I view this not as a very useful result because in reality, I don't, I mean, if I'm thinking of optimizing my stock portfolio, I don't predict 30 years down the road, right? So this is, this is not the way that we make, um, you know, that we solve online problems with predictions. We use short-term predictions, and we get a lot of value from short-term predictions. So there has to be something wrong with this model of uh, predictions. And, and I think the reason why it's in some sense both too optimistic and too pessimistic at the same time, which is a really bad situation, right? So it's too optimistic within the window, uh, and it's too pessimistic outside of the window. Um, and so, but then what else do you do? Uh, if you're thinking about predictions, you could talk about using IED noise, but that's silly. You should never look at a prediction model with IED noise, because if I'm predicting for PV, for example, if it's cloudy, uh, you know, if I predict that it's cloudy an hour from now and it's not cloudy an hour from now, then I'm wrong an hour and a minute from now, too. And I'm wrong in a big way, and that's a very correlated error. Uh, and so ignoring correlations in these predictions is a terrible idea. Uh, but if you're going to start to model prediction uh, correlation, then it seems like you need some sort of stochastic model for the thing here. And how would you write a stochastic model for the combination of electricity prices and solar availability and you know PV? And all that? It, you would not want to write down a stochastic model for that. And if, anything you write down is going to be way too simplistic. And this is kind of the way most of the work on prediction goes. You're kind of stuck in this. You know, it's hard to write down a general model that allows you to do something with predictions, and so you're stuck looking at numerical results. So I think that this is sort of a big open question for anybody working in this space. Is predictions are clearly crucial to online decision-making problems. And we do a terrible job in the theoretical community of modeling them in a way that lets us understand the value of predictions for algorithms. And so uh, you know, my slide to, to piss people off is you know, worst case analysis, stochastic analysis, you know, numeric, they all have big problems. right? And this is what all of the work on predictions does. Uh, you know, stochastic too sensitive, numeric, you don't get any guarantees. and you're, you know, and you know, worst case, we already saw, it doesn't give the right sorts of answers. And so we need new models. And I don't have much time, so I'm going to go very quickly over this. But uh, we have uh, a paper. This is a very new paper uh, where we have something that I think is a nice middle ground. So it lets us, and it draws from the kind of EE filtering world and tries to connect that with the online algorithms worst case world. And so this is the way that, we, that I think is a very nice, uh, reasonable way of modeling predictions, where you take your prediction about ti at time tau about time t, 
and you add sort of a one-pass filter noise to it. Uh, and so what does that mean? We have our per step noise, which is this part is going to be IID. This is sort of the noise if, uh, of one step prediction error. And we pass that through uh, a causal filter here. And so we have our weighting factor. And this is going to be, uh, think of this as a power law in real situations. And this is telling you in some sense how important the noise at t minus s is for the prediction at time t. And so with this simple form, uh, you have something where predictions get refined as time goes forward. So as you move forward, you have a natural re refinement process telling you how your, how your prediction improves for time t as tau goes to tau plus 1 to tau plus 2. You have noisy predictions as you look further before. You have arbitrary correlation uh, that includes both long range and short range and whatever mix you want. And it's really nice. So you get structural form that matches what comes out of if you had made predictions using a weighted, uh, weighted, mood of weighted move average Wiener filter, Kalman filter, and these sorts of things. So it generalizes the error you would have had if you had started with a stochastic process and put this filter on top of it to make predictions. But we don't make any of those assumptions. We just do a worst case assumption on the, you know, we basically have stochastic assumption on the noise and worst case assumption on the instance. So what we do is we can be adversarial over the underlying process but the adversary has to give you an adapted prediction for the process. So I assume you have kind of an unbiased predictor, but the adversary is determining the instance. And so you get a really nice middle ground between you don't need to assume a sensitive stochastic process. You don't need to make any of that assumptions. You get the benefit of robustness of worst case guarantee. But you get the benefit of the stochastic analysis in having a structural form for the error. And I think this matches reality, right? You want, to be, you want your system to work in a general situation. And so you want to be robust to the underlying instance that you're working on. But you do want to assume that your predictor is good. You want to assume that your predictor is adapted. You've spent time doing that. Uh, and for this works really well for the data center world because they're, you know, in some sense, the prediction team is very different. There's a team at HP that's giving us a predictor. We just have to incorporate it. We don't know what models they use. We're not using their models. We just have a prediction that they're telling us is adapted and has these properties. And we want to give a control algorithm that works with that predictor. And this kind of model lets you have that separation. And basically, once you have this, I'll go very quickly because I'm out of time, uh, you can actually prove that algorithms can do well for com both competitive ratio and regret. And so uh, the, what, what you might initially guess is something like a receding horizon control algorithm. That doesn't work. Uh, I won't go over it if what it is. But what does work is what we call an averaging fixed horizon control algorithm. Uh, and here, what, average, what I mean by averaging fixed horizon control is you take a fixed horizon control algorithm which is kind of dumb. So given a prediction window of length w, you just make a decision. You make a decision about the whole trajectory using these predictions. And you don't bother to rethink it as time goes forward. You just stick with that. Even though at this step you have better information, at this step you have better information, you stick with the decision you made with the poor information. And then you only rethink when you get to the whole new prediction window. So that's fixed horizon control. And what we do with averaging fixed horizon control is it's sort of a wisdom of the crowds result. You take a bunch of these dumb algorithms and you average their choices. So you take you know, one that starts at time t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3. You have w plus 1 of those if you have a w size prediction window. You average those. You average those dumb algorithms. And you get an algorithm that is better than receding horizon control, uh, at least for this sort of measure. So you get an algorithm from that averaging that works well for both competitive ratio and regret. And the, the technical result is up here, but basically what it says is you do well uh, with constant order prediction, so asymptotically minimal amount of prediction. Uh, and you do well, not always, but you do well in any case when an online algorithm could do well. There's some places where you can't do well just because there's too much noise. You can't improve upon, upon the noise. And so this is, this is the condition. And you can prove that in these conditions up to uh, this constant is in tight, but up to a constant error we have uh, every instance that you can do well, you do well with AFC. Uh, and we could do well not just in expectation, but we can prove tight concentration results on the performance as well. But anyway, so that's that. Uh, now, I don't claim that this is an optimal algorithm. We're doing well. I think there's a lot of nice space for looking at other algorithms here that uh, use predictions even more effectively than, than averaging fixed horizon control does. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of more interested in the, the model here than the algorithm. I think. Uh, I'm really excited about finding ways of putting predictions into online algorithm problems, not just OCO, but other online algorithms problems. Because I think this is one of those things where 
theory doesn't match reality very well. Reality, you always use predictions, and they're valuable. In theory, we just can't say why they're valuable. We can't design algorithms that make use of them effectively. Uh, okay, so I'll wrap up there. Basically, you know, if you take away two things from the talk, uh, you know, yes, data centers are energy hogs, but hopefully we can, in the next few years, make them uh, positive for the grid, not a negative for the grid, and actually use them as a resource, not just view them as a hog. Uh, and I think you know, predictions are the crucial tool for these sorts of online problems, and we need new models and new algorithms and new ways of thinking about how to incorporate them. Uh, so if you're interested in this stuff, we're, we have a, a semester-long program at the Simons Institute at Berkeley uh, this fall. Uh, where there will be four different workshops on algorithms and uncertainty and the, you know, the good and the bad about how to incorporate uncertainty in algorithms. And so I'm one of the organizers, Bobby Kleinberg, Avram Blum, uh, and a few others are organizing it as well. So if you're interested in that, uh, just let me know, and I'll end there. Thanks. I went over. It's my fault. <laughs> yes. Yes. So incentive pricing is a is a better approach uh, for them. And I think the the key thing that's misaligned in today's programs is the risk tolerance. So the the people that are participating in demand response markets today have a much higher risk tolerance than data centers. And we need to be aware of that if we want to incentivize these people to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, here's a gift. So oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I see a picture. Maybe we should throw it. <laughs>